Good evening. I am so delighted to welcome you to the third in a series of four presentations that our Rhodes College faculty have put together under the leadership of Jeff Bakewell and the Meeman Center on the topic of COVID-19 and its impact uh, on all of us. Um, the impetus for this series was really the recognition that liberal arts colleges and Rhodes in particular are uniquely positioned to provide an interdisciplinary understanding of a phenomenon that is affecting us mind, body, and spirit. Um, the kind of thinking we do at a place like Rhodes College really lends itself to deepening our understanding of such complex phenomena and the kind of whole scale disruption that we have all seen. Not only do we feel able to do that, at Rhodes we feel a responsibility to do that. We see the learning that goes on at Rhodes as in the service of healing a broken world. And we want to be able to share our learning, share our understanding, and learn in turn from those around us. So sharing these panels openly with our community near and far felt like an important responsibility to us. In the first session, for those of you who were not with us, we brought scientists together to talk about the biology of the virus, to talk about the potential for a vaccine, and, to, and the mathematics behind the uh, projections of cases uh, that we read about. Session two turned to the historical and literary representations of uh, plagues and viruses and gave us a kind of grounding in how the way we're thinking about this current moment compares to the way historians and writers have talked about plagues of the past. Tonight, we are gonna bring faculty from our social science departments together. And they are gonna talk about how a biological phenomenon becomes intimately intertwined with uh, social structures, including the economy, education, and already existing structural inequalities. This is particularly timely uh, in, because since we have begun this, this um, series, obviously our world has also been uh, overwhelmed by a series of uprisings that have become truly global in nature, traveling under the banner that Black Lives Matter, and in response to the, the killing of George Floyd and others, and the uh, history of structural racism in this country and anti-Black racism that, that those, those murders represent. So I think our speakers tonight are particularly well situated to help us make sense of these connections and to show us the ways in which this constellation of uprising and virus are more than just coincidentally related. So I look forward to your questions. You'll notice there's a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. You can start asking questions at any point. Our speakers are gonna each make brief presentations and then we will leave time for questions uh, from, from you. So please feel free to make use of that, of that button. Um, one of the best parts of being the president of Rhodes College is that I have multiple opportunities to work with and learn from the brilliant minds of our faculty. And tonight I am joined by three of these incredible scholar scholars. Uh, each of them is a master teacher. Each of them is a dedicated researcher and a blessing to the Rhodes community and the Memphis community. So let me introduce the three of them. I will start with Dr. Aixa Marchand, she is an assistant professor of psychology and educational studies here at Rhodes. She teaches educational psychology, research methods, and educational statistics. Dr. Mashan's research focuses on how black parents make sense of educational inequities and how that relates to their engagement with their children's schools. She is a member of the Family Centered Schools team at Whole Child Strategies, which is a nonprofit organization that supports children, families, and neighborhoods in Memphis who are disproportionately affected by poverty. Her PhD was earned at the University of Michigan, and we are delighted that she has joined the faculty at Rhodes College. 
Our colleague, Dr. Kendra G. Hotz, will also be a panelist. Dr. Hotz, Kendra, is the Robert R. Waller Professor of, Psych of Population Health and Associate Professor of Religious Studies at Rose College. She's the inaugural director of the college's post-baccalaureate certificate in health equity and serves as the director of a three-year grant program funded by the Andrew Mellon Foundation. Um, that is designed to build a culture of health equity in Memphis through engagement with the public humanities. Uh, Dr. Hotz's research focuses on religious belonging, racism, and health equity. She's co-authored several books, including Dust and Breath, A Theological Engagement with Health Disparities, and Transforming Care, A Christian Vision of Nursing Practice. Dr. Hotz has been named the faculty in residence at the Center for Bioethics and Health Equity at Le Bonheur Children's Hospital and theologian in residence at the Church Health Center here in Memphis. So welcome, Kendra. Our third panelist is Dr. Marshall Graham. Uh, Marshall sh serves as professor and chair of the Department of Economics at Rhodes College. He has over a dozen academic publications related to the sport of horse racing in journals um, across uh, you know, academic journals. He uh, finished ninth out of 670 contestants in the National Handicap Championship, so very much applied economics. Um, and he has been a, a, a owner of, horse, uh, of horses and a racer himself. Um, he is um, very engaged in that work in addition to his teaching and teaches classes on, um, on statistics and handicapping as well as um, uh, more theoretical economics. So I'm delighted to welcome all three of you here. And Marshall, I'm gonna to start tonight with you. And I wondered if you could help us understand how should the ordinary person, the lay person, not um, econom an economist, how do we best understand the economic impact of COVID-19? Well, again, thanks for uh, having me on this panel. Um, uh, President Haas, uh, Professor Bakewell, um, Again, in terms of uh, looking at the overall macroeconomy, I think that, uh, you know, I'll be speaking in averages and aggregates, but to each of you listening to the audience, this has affected you in different ways um, in terms of your work, your income. Uh, some of you have been better off. Some of you are, are worse off. But uh, if we look at just the overall numbers, it's, it's dramatic. And I think it's important <laughs> to think about where we have come from. 2019 was maybe the strongest, one of the strongest years um, uh, one of the strongest economies that we've had in, in American history. We were in the midst of the longest expansion in American history until COVID-19. Uh, unemployment rate was 3.5%. The S&P 500, the equities markets were up 30% in 2019. And so there were some warning signs about a declining economy. Um, I would say about 50% of economists predicted a recession in 2021, but partially that was due to the fact that we just hadn't had a recession in so long, right? And so we hadn't had a decline. And so at some point, right, the uh, things were gonna slow down, but it, we expected a very mild recession and continued long run growth. COVID-19 has been unlike anything we've seen and the numbers have been jarring. So the recession officially began in 2020, in, uh, in February of 2020, not surprisingly, I think we all knew it at that point, that's when it began. Um, that was just announced uh, two days ago. Um, and so our expansion was 10 years and eight months, the longest in um, economic history. And when the numbers turned, they turned dramatically. I mean, if you looked in mid-March, we started to get uh, un initial unemployment claims of 150,000, 200,000, which were, you know, dwarfed previous numbers. And then by the end of March, uh, initial jobless claims jumped to 7 million on March 28th. So this is something that we've just never seen before. The unemployment rate jumped from 4.4% in March of 2020 to 14.7% in April of 2020. The labor force participation rate, which is the number of, of people who are, are either working or looking for jobs, that fell off dramatically as well from 62.7% to 60.2%. So we had a lot fewer people with jobs and a lot fewer people even looking for jobs. These were dramatic uh, jarring changes 
Uh, equities markets, which again reflect the value of American businesses, uh, fell off by 35%. Um, consumers stopped spending. Uh, uh, consum household consumption fell by 7%. Durable goods consumption fell by 13%. Businesses stopped spending. Um, investments fell, fell by 10.5%. Everywhere you look, the numbers were, were unprecedented. Um, if you even look at projections for the second quarter of 2020, they're really frightening. I mean, it's a, a decline of a projected decline of 40% in production. And so this measure of GDP picks up production, expenditures, incomes. We expect that to fall off by 40%. Now, it's important to understand that that is an annualized number. So even a number, so it's really 10% multiplied by four because we take that quarterly number and we annualize it. But even 10% is something that's not been seen since the Great Depression. So I think that, that you know, for murals, everyone's personal experiences to what the numbers tell us, this is frightening stuff. We don't really have a context to put this into outside of the, the uh, you know, Black Death of the 1300s and we don't have any good data. The two big pandemics, that we've seen before, 1918, that killed 2% of the world's population, uh, killed um, you know, 750,000 people in the US, 30% uh, of the country was infected, had, it basically had no effect on the economy. We had a very mild recession in 1918, fairly quick recovery with inflation, and then a fairly severe recession in the early 20s, it's unrelated. Um, we had a pandemic in 1957, 1958, that was a severe, a severe flu that killed 100,000 people. We had uh, the first quarter of 1950 was the biggest traction since the Great Depression. But again, that's only tangentially related to the flu. What was different about this is we shut down our economy, right? So we closed the economy. We made that choice, um, uh, you know, in, in making the tough decision over, over you know, jobs, income in the economy and lives and that's so i think that's what made this very different now i think the other thing that's interesting about this is that that we're starting to really see how this is going to play out and and i like to think of this as, as really there's there's i'm going to present to you just real quickly the best and worst case scenarios here and i think that the way that the market in the equities market i think is a good predictor in terms of again it, it represents the value of U.S. businesses and represents, again, per, is a leading indicator of gross domestic product and a leading indicator of how well the economy is doing. It has mostly recovered. Uh, S&P 500 and Dow Jones Index are where they were in December of last year. So I, I guess ask yourself, do you feel better about the overall economy than you did in December of 2019? I don't know if I do or not, but the um, the market is saying that the recovery is happening. There are even some who argue that we're already out of recession, that this will be a very short recession and we'll have a very quick recovery, what's called a V-shaped recovery. Severe recession and then severe expansion as we get back to work, firms hire workers uh, to go back to work. Hopefully it's been short enough where businesses haven't collapsed and we go on and, uh, and the recovery is quick. I think they're promising signs in terms of uh, vaccines in terms of herd immunities. Uh, I think the one very notable thing was the employment numbers. The unemployment rate actually fell in May, which was shocking. Uh, most economists projected a number around 19% and it fell to 13%. And so the Fed's projections for unemployment are 9.3% by the end of this year and 6.5% by the end of 2021. It's important to note that when our last recession ended in the middle of 2009, the unemployment rate was 6.7% still in 2013. So the Fed is even indicating that, hey, we're almost there, right? Even people are talking about positive GDP growth, positive growth in production, positive growth in incomes for 2021. Equities markets are rallying. They're 50% above their, um, above their um, uh, uh, whatever, their, their troughs, their bottoms. And so I think that if you think about what how people are reacting and people in aggregate is they see the finish line on this thing. Um, now, again, I'm a gambling man. Uh, President Haas already mentioned that. And I'm actually taking a more um, uh, risk averse stance. I would be betting the other direction right now. Um, uh, you know, and I think this leads into the worst case scenario. And I'm not going to be a doom and gloom guy, but I think they might, there might be an overreaction to how, how promising things look. 
Um, you know, our worst case scenario is clearly this, COVID returns, uh, and it returns in a more virulent way. There are more lockdowns. Uh, um, at that point, businesses start to collapse, right? Uh, um, and so, and that could be very tragic to the economy um, and, and, and be jarring, especially when businesses are now opening up. Um, so I think that's the, you know, that's clear and that's obvious. That's a potential problem. I think there's another hidden problem is the, um, no matter how you measure it, there's been a huge increase in the money supply. And ultimately inflation or increases in prices are as a monetary phenomenon. If there's more money out there, every dollar's worth less and that leads to higher prices. Now we've not seen any inflation in this country since um, the 1970s. And I think that's easy for us to forget. Uh, uh, there are many of y'all out there who've seen effectively no sustained inflation in your lifetime. Hell, I haven't seen it in my lifetime, right? And so we're talking about um, something that we've forgotten about. Well, it was a clear biggest issue of the 1970s. And the money supply, no matter how you cut it, has been increased by 25 to 60%, depending on measures. So the Fed is pumping a lot of money into the economy, $7 trillion in the economy by buying bonds, by pumping money in the economy, and that has a stimulus effect that helps stimulate the economy. Um, but the question is, is that if we start to recover, will the Fed be able to re remove that money before we start to see prices rise? And so I think that's a hidden fear. Now, that's not, that no one's seeing that right now. Long-term interest rates are still low. People are still projecting inflation rates three or 4% five years from now. Um, even 10 years from now, but I think that's a hidden, a hidden concern, especially if the recovery is quick, right? If we really start growing uh, in the third quarter, then we could see um, difficulty for the in Fed's removing money from the economy, a difficult time in the Fed, you know, when we're in this recovery trying to raise rates, they raise rates in order to pull money out of the economy. And so that could be inflationary. So, so that is a concern for me. We've been, the Fed has been very proactive the federal government has been very proactive in order to soften the blow by COVID, and I think that's a good thing. But I do think there are some, some concerns about what this means for the future. So um, I tend to be marginally more pessimistic on this. I'm gonna to tend to bet a little bit against the economy at this point. I would be a seller in the market right now, but I could be totally wrong. Unfortunately, this is, re is this recorded? Hopefully it's not recorded. You can come back and laugh. At I hope you come back at me in January and you're laughing at me. Um, about all this, but, um, uh, you know, anyway, we'll see. It's now on record. <laughs> Thank you. I know that's always a, a, a risk when you place your bets that uh, real time can, can show you whether you're wrong. Marshall, a quick um, follow-up question. Is there, um, when you talk about the V-shaped recovery and the danger being inflation, is that more likely to have disparate effects on uh, Americans? In other words, uh, we've seen some forms of recovery that were sort of the boat raises for everyone and others where, uh, you know, some people are zooming ahead and others fall farther behind. How do you see that risk of inflation impacting that sort of disparities? Well, I think the, the inflation effect is going to, um, it's really hard to tell what industries are going to be affected, certainly industries that are in decline are going to struggle as if their inflation is rising faster than, in, if inflation is rising, then, then wages will start to, you know, if the wages don't keep up, right, uh, then the purchasing power for workers will decline. So I think that, that uh, there'll be certain sectors of the economy that will be hurt. Um, so that would be a, a concern. I also think it, you know, the sort of supply chain disruption, uh, mm -hmm. I think borrowers, uh, 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 will be affected as, uh, um, as, uh, as they're paying back dollars that are, are um, um, sorry, um, lenders will be affected as they're paying, they're getting back dollars that are worth less than they had planned for. So I think all sorts of, you know, sort of decision-making uh, redistribution of wealth associated with that will be problematic. I do, I do think the, the, other, the other point you're bringing up is how has the effect of COVID-19 on the economy, how has that affected people um, you know, in, across the economy. And that's somewhat hard to tell at this point. Um, we just don't, you know, part of kind of everything we've been dealing with has been, has been, you know, we've had so much data lag. I think this, the one thing that's interesting about COVID is we just, we haven't really known where we've been the whole time. And so this will be a great 
project two or three years down the road to determine what happened. Um, so as far as looking at the employment numbers, what have we seen? Well, we've seen that this has disproportionately affected women in terms of unemployment for women has gone up more than unemployment for men. The recovery in employment was better for white and Hispanic Americans. It was, it was not very good for African Americans and, and, and actually uh, Asian American unemployment went up. Now, I don't know, look, I don't know about, that could all be regional, right? So it could be, for example, that certain parts of the country have higher unemployment rates and that tends to be where, you know, uh, Asian Americans live. You know, I, I don't know. Yeah, for the reason. Right? But, so we don't know yet. I think that that a lot of that stuff we'll, we'll have to disaggregate mm -hmm. now, but it'd be interesting to find out. Thank you. Thank you very much. Kendra, I'm really um, excited to hear you talk about, you know, what you are thinking and learning from this. There have been so many conversations about why and how this kind of constellation of events has happened and how is it that we now see what, what even very seasoned activists are saying an uprising that's different than what we've seen in the past, more global, more focused, um, involving a wider range of Americans. Uh, as well. And, you know, sometimes you hear people say, well, we have more free time because a lot of people are home. And so we, our attention could be focused um, in different ways. Um, you, but, but you also, I think, hear people thinking, and, and because I know something about the work you've done, that the sort of shock when people began to understand the disparate health impacts of COVID. COVID seems like such a neutral, all comers sort of um, danger right? We imagine a virus doesn't harbor racist feelings. And the fact that it is having disparate impact on Black Americans is, I think, for many folks who didn't fully grasp what we mean when people talk about sort of structural racism, it's sort of a, a wake-up call and a sort of understanding on a deeper level um, the impact between um, racist policies, et cetera, and um, these sort of impacts that can be at least on the surface without the kinds of emotions or feelings that people sometimes associate with racism when they think of it largely as an individual phenomenon. So I'm, I'm just very curious to hear your thoughts about that and, and your views about, um, about what's happening both physically and to our communities from this disease and then what that tells us about the larger context. Yeah, I'm happy to do that. I'm gonna share my screen. I've got a few slides here. So let's start just by, you know, a lot of you probably saw the headlines showing that COVID-19 is um, affecting African-American people and communities at, at far greater rates than it is others. And so I want to spend some time talking about that. Um, racialized health disparities are not simply black and white, but for the sake of uh, simplicity tonight, I'm just going to talk about African-American disparities. Um, so what I want to do is um, give us a chance to think, just first see the scope of the uh, disparities, and then I'll give you some explanatory mechanisms. Um, so first of all, I'm going to be talking about racialized identity, not race. This is really important because race is not biologically real. It's socially and politically real. So race isn't something that you are. Race is something that is done to you. That is to say, we interpret each other through racialized lenses, and that's ultimately going to become what explains these differences to us. So first, let's just start with some numbers. Um, in the state of Mississippi, which is about 38% African American, 72% of deaths from COVID-19 have been African Americans, and the infection rate is 56%. So sorry, I said that wrong. 56% of COVID-19 infections are among African Americans. The state of Illinois is 15% Black, but 43% of COVID-19 deaths have been among African Americans, and 28% of the infections of COVID-19 are African Americans. Michigan is 14% African American, but 40% of the deaths from COVID-19 are Black, and 33% of, of those infected are African American. The state of Louisiana is shocking. 33% African American, 70% of the COVID-19 deaths have been African Americans. So the scope of the disparities is enormous. Shelby County is 54% African American and 41% white. But you see here that about 63% of our infections are among African Americans. So we have racialized disparities here as well. 
66% of our COVID-19 deaths are among African Americans. And we do have some, um, we don't have a complete reporting about uh, the racialized identity of different, of, um, different deaths. And so that number might shift a bit. Now, this is a map of Shelby County. And what we're looking at here are where we have our highest infection rates. So just to get you oriented, I hope you can see my mouse moving around on that map. I'm not sure if you can. These lighter colors are, oh, thank you, somebody was nodding. <laughs> uh, these lighter colors are the places where we have lower infection rates. And then these darker colors are the places where we have our highest infection rates. So just to get you oriented, this is the Jackson Corridor. So this is sort of the Smoky City Klondike area. We're coming down here through Binghampton. This is Orange Mound. And then across South Memphis, we're seeing higher infection rates. This is a more affluent area of downtown. And then we're moving through Midtown here. Hey, there's Rhodes College right there. And then uh, moving to the east and the eastern suburbs, we're finding much, much lower rates of COVID-19 infections. Why? So a quick root cause analysis. If I had long enough to go into this, I would, I would do all the history that gets us here. But the short answer is racism. That is to say that our society is structured in such a way that it was completely predictable that COVID-19 infections would hit African-American communities hardest. Let me give you five more specific uh, uh, explanations of how this is racist. So I wanna start by talking about allostatic load and just briefly what that is. Our bodies evolved in a context where the greatest threats to us were predators. And so we evolved a, flight or, a fight or flight response that was designed to help us to survive if the challenge was being chased by a bear. When we go into fight or flight response, our body produces a lot of a stress hormone called cortisol. Allostatic load is simply the measure of that stress hormone in our bodies. So when we think about that acute and, and kind of episodic stress, ah, a bear is chasing me, then what I need is for my heart to race so that I can run away, right? I need um, for uh, my blood to become thick with a coagulating agent so I don't bleed to death if I'm injured. And I also need to slow down how quickly I use up blood sugar so that I have a ready source of energy. But also, I don't want to get sleepy just because it's been a long time since I slept last. And I don't want to get sleepy just because it's getting dark. So one of the things that a high allostatic load will do is keep me awake. Now, those are for acute and episodic stresses like being chased by a bear. But when you live in a racist society and your identity is legible as stigmatized because of race, then you are likely to feel threatened all of the time. The society feels like a bear that is chasing you. And when that happens, your circadian rhythms are disrupted. That means you're not sleeping well at night. That disrupted sleep, sleep deprivation, suppresses your immune function and makes you more susceptible to infectious diseases like COVID-19. But also remember what I said about the racing heart and the slowed um, use of the blood glucose and the thickened blood with that fibrinogen co coagulating agent. If your stresses are chronic and systemic because of racism, not acute and episodic because the problem's a bear, then that elevated heart rate will be um, associated with um, hypertension and cardiovascular disease. And that um, coagulating agent in your blood will lead to blood clotting and strokes. And the slowed rate with which you use up the blood sugar will lead to type 2 diabetes. And that means that you're going to have precisely the kinds of comorbidities that are associated with higher mortality from COVID-19. So here we've got some numbers showing that your chances of dying from COVID-19 are dramatically higher if you have these comorbidities. 80% of the deaths from COVID-19 are among populations with cardiac conditions. 33% um, are among populations with type 2 diabetes. So what we're seeing here is that a racist society will produce 
bodily conditions that increase the chances that African Americans will have a suppressed immune system and will have the kinds of comorbidities that exacerbate the disease process of COVID-19. And that's not just true for racialized poverty, because certainly being impoverished feels threatening all the time. That's also true for professional class, upper class African Americans. These comorbidities affect um, everyone across the spectrum of stigmatized populations. Another reason why COVID-19 was predictable for having disparities among African Americans is because poverty is racialized in the US. And that means that our low wage essential workers who can't practice uh, social distancing are more likely to be African American. So for instance, if you uh, work as a, cash as a cashier in a grocery store and you have regular contact with hundreds of people a day and they're close to you and they are refusing to wear masks because they feel that this is an infringement on their freedom, you are much more likely to come into contact with a heightened kind of viral load, which is more likely to mean that you're infected and you're also more likely to be living in um, a kind of housing dense situation where you're gonna share that infection with others. Now, why is it the case that poverty is racialized? Just very briefly, this is a 1930s era redlined map of Memphis. Redlining was a practice of the federal agency that's the predecessor of our federal housing authority. And what they did was rank essentially every neighborhood in the major cities of the US for riskiness. And if you were ranked as a risky neighborhood, then it was essentially impossible to get any kind of public or private investment. And because of segregation, you couldn't choose to move out of those neighborhoods. The thing is, if you lived in a neighborhood with good quality housing stock and great transportation infrastructure and locally owned businesses and good schools and plenty of churches and banks and so forth, you could still get redlined if you were a minority neighborhood or if you were adjacent to a minority neighborhood and perceived as being at risk for integration. So just to get you oriented, this is Overton Park. Yay, Rhodes College is right here. See these redlined areas? That's the Smoky City Klondike area. This is the Jackson Corridor. Now we're coming down through Binghampton. This is Orange Mound. And now we are across South Memphis. Remember that map I showed you? What you're seeing is that the map of Shelby County today mirrors the map of the 1930s era redlining. You have to pretend all of this is not up here because that was not part of, that's, that's north of where this map is. But essentially what you're seeing is that you've got um, a predictable pattern of racialized poverty based on a deliberately racist housing policy from the 1930s. And we still live with the consequences of that today. The, the short answer to why poverty is racialized and why COVID-19 disparities are predictable is white supremacy is written into our neighborhoods. A couple of other quick explanations of why COVID-19 disparities were predictable for African Americans. The first has to do with access to healthcare. Of course, we don't have universal access to health care in the US, and Tennessee is not a state that expanded Medicaid. There's a fascinating comparison between our outcome, our health outcomes between Tennessee and Kentucky in a new book published by Jonathan Metzl last year called Dying of Whiteness. And so what we're seeing here is a difference in access to health care. Even if you're feeling very sick, you may not be able to get into um, a health care facility because you don't have that insurance card. And then also there's bias in healthcare. We have good numbers from February and March showing that when African Americans did come into healthcare context with symptoms that indicated COVID-19, they were much more likely to be sent home without being tested than, than their white part counterparts would be. And so that means that a white person with COVID-19 would quickly have been isolated and quarantined and less likely to pass that on to other people in their community. But if you were African-American, you didn't know what you had. And so you were more likely to, to feel sick, not to be able to choose to stay home from work because of that and to pass it on to others in your community. 
And then finally, there is bias in our triage protocols. This is not individual bias of physicians and clinicians. This is a bias that's written into the computer algorithms that determine who gets um, a ventilator. When you have two people who need respiratory support because COVID-19 is affecting their lung function, uh, triaging systems like Apache 2 give them scores based on the likelihood of organ failure over time. If you have significant comorbidities like diabetes and hypertension, then your Apache score is worse than somebody who doesn't have those comorbidities. And that means all things being equal, an African-American is less likely to receive ventilator support and to survive um, a very severe course of the disease than a white person would be. So what does that mean? It means that we see disparities in COVID-19 simply demonstrating to us a fundamental underlying inequality in our society. And that explains why we get these disparities. I think it's also worth noting at this juncture that the American Association, the, the American Public Health Association has identified over-policing as an impediment to building public health among African-American populations. So those inequalities and the connections they have to um, health disparities go deep. Thank you so much, uh, Kendra. Those are, it's just heartbreaking to hear that very clear explanation of the circular nature and the sort of endemic, um, long lasting effects of these uh, racist structures on health outcomes. Um, as we turn, uh, Dr. Marchand, to you, I, we often, particularly all of us are educators, we think of education as the promise to break the cycle of generational poverty. We think of uh, education as the cycle to um, break the, the um, barriers that uh, racist structures set up. So one of the most heartbreaking pieces to this uh, health crisis has been the closing of the schools. And many of us think that's you know, a, such a symbol of hopelessness. We tend to think of education as the hopeful sign. I, I know you have a richer and deeper understanding of how education both um, undoes, but also replicates and replaces these, these very deep systemic problems. So I'm, I, I hope you will share um, your thoughts with us on, on that. Definitely, definitely. Um, thank you, President Haas. Thank you, Kendra and Marshall for laying a great foundation for me to build off of. Um, I'm really happy to join you all. Thank everyone of you at home for joining in. Um, so yes, Dr. Um, President Haas, you're completely correct. So, you know, there's a saying that education is the great equalizer, but that's false. Um, education actually reprodu reproduces a lot of what we see in society. So it's actually a social reproduction sort of process. Um, so I first want to um, acknowledge the moment we're in. So when I was invited to join this panel, Ahmaud Arbery and Brianna Taylor had already been murdered, but it hadn't been a news story yet. And George Floyd was still alive right? But, and at that time, COVID-19 was what was um, on TV every time we turned it on. But now, every time we turn on the TV, we're, you know, dealing with this reckoning of what racism has done to many of these systems. And I don't want to say what it's done. I mean, many of these systems were designed to function the way that they're functioning now, right? Um, so as we're talking about police brutality and we're understanding what that does to society, um, police brutality also influences education. So uh, I don't know if you all remember a couple of years ago, there was a video that was sort of circulated around the internet. It was 2015 where we saw a cop egregiously sort of pull the student out of her desk. So we're seeing that policing is happening within public schools, within schools in general, um, so much so that the ACLU just put out some numbers and it shows that 3 million students go to schools that have cops, but no nurses. 
um, 10 million students go to schools with cops, but no social workers. So we're really starting to see how this is infiltrating all aspects of sort of our society as we know it. Um, there are many other ways that racism plays a role um, in sort of in education. So whether that's sort of creating a system that tracks black students into lower classes, sort of basically locking them out of APs and honors classes. So that's just me wanting to just sort of set the stage for education in general. So I'm going to start to share um, my slides. While you do that, I just want to remind everyone that uh, you can add questions to the Q&A and we'll be at a point in a little bit where we'll turn to those. So if you have thoughts that you'd like to ask our panelists, don't hesitate to, to do that. So please, Dr. Mercer. Yes. So for me, as a psychologist, I want to just sort of either introduce you or remind you of um, this visual. So this is called Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs. And if you see at the bottom, we have um, physiological needs. So that includes um, very basic sort of like food, water, rest. And then building off of that, then we have this other basic need of just security, right? So what Kendra was saying about the bear, right? That's a basic need that we need to feel safe. And then sort of building upon that, then we have these other psychological needs such as esteem and belongingness and love. And then it's only then that we can sort of reach this peak of the pyramid um, where one can reach their full potential. So when we're thinking about you know, COVID-19 and schools closing, um, one, we're realizing that schools are more than just institutions of you know, learning. They provide a lot of direct needs and direct services to students. So we're even seeing that um, with schools being closed, you know, there is um, a need for food. And in Shelby County Schools, they've partnered with the YMCA of Memphis in the Mid-South to provide meals. So there have been sort of set up um, points at community centers and at libraries around the city where families can come and get the meals that you know, students would have gotten had they been in school. Um, and, you know, going back to what Marshall was saying, unfortunately, as more people are filing for unemployment, that need is growing. Okay, so that's sort of hitting on that basic physiological need that schools are providing. Um, also, you know, we've seen, unfortunately, numbers of domestic violence rising. So even thinking about that security and that safety um, that sort of being put at the forefront at this time. Um, you can think about schools being a place of, you know, socializing where students can find community. So that's lacking, right? So many of these very foundational needs that people have, um, that's, that's being affected because of the fact that schools are closed. Um, so it's affecting teachers. I mean, sorry, I wanted to start. It's affecting students, but it's also affecting teachers. So it's sort of affecting everybody. Um, and, you know, sometimes things are not perfect. So this might be comical, right? But it's actually really real at this point. Um, you know, this is a visual that's saying that, you know, the actual base need that we all need is Wi-Fi. And that's unfortunately not true, right? Um, in this increase in uh, virtual learning, some students aren't even able to access their classes because of this Wi-Fi situation, right? We're learning a lot about this digital divide. Um, who has access? Who has the, the devices and the technology? Um, and this is structural in nature too. There are areas that aren't even wired to have the same type of connectivity that other areas have access to. Um, and when we think about devices, you know, we've seen many sort of philanthropic donations in order to get these devices into the hands of students. But you also have to think about learning how to use it, right? So it's like, here's a laptop, here's a tablet, but, you know, where's the training behind that? Um, it sort of asks more questions and then providing answers. It's also, you know, logistics. If, if we're giving students these this technology, what happens if they move schools or what happens if they enroll in a charter school? So there's a lot of things that I think hadn't been thought through. It was just this immediate necessity to sort of give devices to the people who need them. Um, so I want to move forward to actually thinking about 
who has um, you know, access. So this is a survey that was done by Parents Together, which is a nonprofit org focused on issues that affect kids and families. So they took um, a sample of 1500 American families nationwide. And if you look at the four bars, we see that this top bar is for families who report less than 25,000 um, annual income. And this bottom bar is sort of that other end, so more than 100,000. And we see that those families who are reporting that they're making less than 25,000, um, about nine to 10% about say that they don't have access. Whereas when we look at that bottom bar, we see that only about 1% of those families, 90% of families who make over $100,000 are saying, no, my students always have access. 90% of them are saying, yeah, we don't have any problems with that. Um, and even when we're looking at what I was saying earlier about um, different areas having disparate access, um, in 2014 through 2018, the census asked this question of who has broadband internet connection. And in Memphis, 33.8% of respondents said that they did not. So that's a third. So a third of the city does not have access, right? So I've heard stories of many students who are having to do their homework on cell phones, right? Um, because that's using data and not Wi-Fi, um, you know, students who are sharing a device with their siblings um, who are maybe you know in a different grade than they are okay so i want to look a little bit more specifically at shelby county schools so um kendra earlier in her slides had mentioned that uh memphis is 54 percent black but if we look at shelby county schools um it's 76 percent black so um this is by design. Um, if you're not aware, you should research the sort of merger and demerger that happened in 2011 and 2013. So I just moved to Memphis last year, but this is something that I had to quickly get up to speed on to see sort of like why the educational landscape is the way that it is here, right? So this is a snapshot of the demographics of Shelby County Schools. And it's a, it's a district that serves 95,000 students. Okay, so it's, it's it's big, right? That's a lot of families and students. Um, so this is a, a report. This is the Digital Access Advisory Committee through Shelby County Schools. And they asked um, on May 6th, this report was um, put out on May 6th, who had access, right? And remember, I had said that this is a, a district that's about 95,000 students but we see that the responses are only about 60,000. So already this is only about a third of people who are responding. And of those third who are responding, or sorry, those two thirds that are responding, 17% are saying that they don't have access to the proper technology. And 13% are saying that they don't have the internet. Okay? So, you know, we're relying, all of us are so reliant on everything internet, right? Meetings, birthday celebrations, this, right? So you can only imagine how so many things are inaccessible to this percentage of people who don't have access. Um, and this also is exacerbating disparities that already existed, right? So it's only sort of creating a larger divide because if students who can't access, they're probably staying stagnant, whereas the students who are being able to log into school are able to, you know, sort of progress as normal. And that's creating this divide between students who have that, you know, connectivity and, and those that don't. Um, we even have to think about students who might have like an IEP. So that's an indiv individualized education plan. And that sort of says, you know, this student should receive accommodations. And oftentimes that's, you know, small group instruction or uh, working with a paraprofessional. In this sort of situation that we're in now, many students who need services aren't able to receive the services that they need through this system of virtual learning. So you, we can only imagine sort of thinking about the students who are most affected by this. Um, and I don't want to put the whole onus on the students, right? So in a survey that went out to teachers in Shelby County Schools pre-COVID now, right, they were asked how confident confident are you in using technology in the classroom? And 60% of teachers said that they're not, right? So we expect that teachers are 
you know, 100% ready to go, know how to use Zoom, know how to use Canvas, Blackboard, Google Classroom, Google Hangouts, all of the things, right? It's even overwhelming to us sometimes. So you can only imagine teachers and their learning curve. And they're probably at home with their own children trying to teach them and teach their classrooms and you know deal with every other stressor that COVID has sort of thrown our way. Um, so another thing is thinking about the cost that it would take to train these teachers to feel confident using this technology. Um, educational technology is wonderful, but it's only as good as the person who's using it. And if they feel comfortable and know all the functionalities of you know, the program. So I wanna zoom in a little bit more into one particular neighborhood in Memphis. And this is a neighborhood that Kendra had mentioned, right? So this is the Klondike Smoky City area. And I wanna show you that Rhodes is right there. So this is less than two miles away from where many of us are. Um, and this is, these are two historically, um, and the two historic African-American communities here in Memphis. Um, and I do some work with Whole Child Strategies, which focuses sort of their efforts within this area. And they've done some needs assessments and they have community organizers who are out there trying to see and learn from the community, what are their needs? Um, and what we're seeing here um, from some data that they shared with me is that in May, 67% of respondents said that they had lost their job or lost income because of the coronavirus. Okay, so that's two thirds of a community. And I haven't even spoken about how, you know, many of these people, many of these people within this community are essential workers. So they're going in um, and their children are left at home to educate themselves, right? And, you know, Kendra also mentioned that, um, you know, many of these black communities here in Memphis are housing dense. And when we're looking, they asked another question on the survey, how many people in total live in your household? Well, the most frequently responded answer here is eight. So you can only imagine how if one person gets exposed to the virus, that is, you know, infecting a lot of other people potentially. And you can also think about the number of children that might be in that household who have to, you know, be taught virtually through devices. Um, so thinking about how that's happening, I just want you to sort of imagine what that household might look like putting together all of the data that I, you know, showed you. This is a less affluent community with high poverty. So they might have been the respondents who said that, you know, 10% don't have devices. Okay, so I guess what now, right? Um, during this time, there's also been a lot of hope, I think. I've seen educators be super creative, whether it's the ways in which they're reaching out to their students. I've seen um, principals reading stories to their students through Facebook Live or all of the graduation parades. So I think there's been great creativity um, to, try to, cre to try to make it seem as normal as possible. Um, I've also seen great unity. So even here in Memphis, a coalition has been created and Whole Child Strategies is part of this and the Refugee Empowerment Program. So it's some organizations here in Memphis who have come together to provide the services that are necessary um, to sort of fill this hole that, you know, the virus has sort of exacerbated. Um, and also, I think about the possibilities. So Shelby County Schools hasn't released a plan for the fall and many other districts haven't, but there's been a lot of possibilities that have been thrown around. So, you know, I've heard some ideas of maybe um, elementary schools go back, middle schoolers and high schoolers stay home and we just spread out classrooms across the buildings in the district. So there's a lot of different ideas that are being thrown around and I think, you know, Marshall had sort of said, there's some uncertainty, no one really knows. And it's hard to plan when everything is so uncertain. But um, what we can do is we can vote. So the school board elections are coming up. Um, those are coming up on August 6th. So I really, really implore you, if you're here in Memphis and you, you know, want to vote, look up these school board members' platforms. What are, what are their sort of ideas about the budget? What are their ideas about what this means for you know, children in Shelby County schools moving forward? So 
yes, um, I hope with this, you have a, a greater picture of what this means for this community and for many communities across the nation. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's not all bad there. Like I said, there was some hope and there was some unity that I've seen. So I hope that, you know, those are the things that remain once the virus is gone. Thank you so much. These are very powerful ideas that you're sharing with us. All, all three of you have talked about um, the difference between sort of longer term structures, the economic structures that might lead to a recession or to a, a, a rise, um, and, and then these sort of short term solutions. We're confronted with this crisis. We have a lot of intervention of government money. We have, well, we'll just give everybody a computer, et cetera. I'm, I'm wondering if you could say a little bit more about the limits of these short-term solutions and what what might be solutions that take into account some of these deeper things. Marshall, maybe you could start by talking about, you know, what are some tools that might be at our disposal to stave off um, the kind of inflationary um, climate that you talked about as a risk, or what are some tools um, at our disposal that might help um, equalize some of the economic impact that we've been talking about? Well, I do think that the, um, that the government has been, you know, they've been very proactive with the payment protection program, with increasing unemployment insurance to really allow businesses to survive, especially small businesses. Um, and, and, you know, if, if we do recover and if businesses are able to open up, then then I think people will look at that as very successful. I think it's hard to do both. So it's hard to be in a situation where, you know, the government is, is putting money into circulation or, or the government is, um, you know, keeping businesses alive, expanding unemployment insurance, and the Fed is, is massively increasing the money supply and not have the potential consequences of, um, of a rapid recovery leading to inflation. So it, it, in many ways, it's this, it's just this tricky decision. Um, do we do what's good for the short run that could have long run consequences? Mm -hmm. I don't think anyone would argue that, that they haven't made the right move because without doing anything, I think businesses would have collapsed. I think there would have been sort of massive unemployment. Um, you know, and so I, I don't, I, and we could have, you know, they could have really, things could have been much more severe. So it's just, you know, the problem that we face is that there are trade-offs in anything, right? To, to do something that, that might be good in the short run, might be bad in the long run, and might also create, um, you know, create moral hazard problems in terms of, you know, uh, 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 you know, businesses then when we recover, over-investing, not keeping a nest egg aside for when problems come along down the road. So I, I just, you know, that's my answer. There's not an easy you know, there's not, since we can't see the future, there's not, we won't know whether this is handled correctly. I think it's a decision that they made that anyone would do, right? Um, but, but, um, but we'll see if it's correct. And remember, there's still another $1.5 trillion in, in federal spending that will occur. So it's, it's, there's, there's more to come. Uh, we just, again, don't know. We'll, this would be great to analyze three years ago, three years ago. <laughs> Aix, if you could take some of that, you know, billions of dollars that are about to be spent and earmark it for something that would help the educational piece that you're talking about, what would you, what would, should we be spending that money on? Is it, if it's not just handing out laptops, is it teacher training? Is it more teachers? Is it better facilities? Is it wraparound services? Where, where could the most impact be made to improve um, these educational situations you've been talking about? So I think a lot of what you said, right? Um, teacher training is really important because um, of what, what I said earlier. So teachers are reporting that this technology, they don't feel confident using it. I also think that in the, the, the moment that we're in, there can be a lot of teacher training around sort of the issues that we're facing, um, structural racism, systemic racism, how that's affecting education. I think that there can be money that is put into that. But also I think about even things as simple as class size, right? So because of um, the virus, we're thinking about, well, we can't have 35 students in a class. And it's like, well, yeah, I could have told you years ago that we can't have 35 students in a 
high school class, right? So, you know, we're thinking about smaller class sizes. So maybe those are things that we can continue moving forward, even when the, you know, virus is over. But these are hopefully positive changes that can be long lasting. Um, so I think a little bit of all of it. Um, you know, education has been defunded for a long time. So if we just put it back into the sort of the basic needs of schools, that'll be greatly, um, you know, invested. Kendra, one of our viewers asked this uh, to you specifically. Um, they used the language of power structures and said, you talked about the way these power structures intersect. How do we, you know, what has to be dismantled first? Where do you start when you're talking about such a systemic form of um, inequity that affects health and income and schooling? Where, where do we start? I, I'm hoping you have some of the, the hope that uh, Aixa offered too. Oh, you're on mute, Kendra. Well, that was a classic thing. Like I, I have started, I don't know how many Zoom meetings by somebody saying, Kendra, you're on mute. <laughs> <laughs> um, that is such a terrific question, and it's also a very liberal arts question to ask, um, because we, once you, we as Americans, we tend to think individually. We, when we see something going wrong, we tend to ask, well, who's making the bad choice, um, or who's making the salutary decision? Who do we praise? Who do we blame? But once you learn to think structurally, then you realize you can you can find you can ask a more productive question and get a more productive pathway. So when you think about root causes of health disparities, any health disparity, they're always rooted in a sense that I lack control mm -hmm. because my body is responding to any scenario where I lack control as though the problem is that I'm being chased by a bear. My body doesn't know that, it, that it's not a bear, right? My body still reacts as though I'm an early hominid and um, you know I, I ran out of blueberries because the bear wanted them. So anything that makes me feel like I lack control will, will produce that fight or flight response. And when that stays in gear all the time, then I'm gonna, then I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna have that allostatic load that produces these disparities. So how do, you can, you, how do you increase someone's sense of control? And essentially hope, the difference between wishful thinking and hope is that hope is where I've got some ground to stand on. I can make a thing happen. Okay, so what would we start with? One of the most basic things that makes it really hard for people to hold stable employment, get to um, health care, make sure that they can get their groceries home in August before the milk spoils is good transportation. We have a terrible transportation infrastructure system that requires people to invest in cars, which are just a waste of money and um and a really drag household income down and so investment in public transit is one of the most cost effective things you can do to reduce health disparities another thing is to remember that unemployment unemployment is a really clear predictor of a health disparity any sense of instability in my employment situation is going to generate that fight or flight response. How am I going to feed my kids? How am I going to make my rent? Well, if you've got a safety net that ensures that loss of employment doesn't mean loss of health care, that you still have some sort of um, some sort of wage to fall back on, so easier access to unemployment benefits, things like that. And then finally, I think we just have to name honestly that um, policing is a major impediment to public health, largely because we've got a huge percentage of our population that feels threatened all the time. Um, I have never been pulled over. Well, first of all, I've rarely been you know, pulled over, even if I'm speeding. Um, I'm legible as white. But if I am, I never worry that I'm not going to survive the encounter. And so even when I'm pretty out of control, because let's face it, having a cop pull you over is an intimidating thing to happen to any of us, it's a relatively acute and episodic kind of stress. Once the cop lets me go, then whew, that's over, right? I don't carry in my body this constant sense that I am threatened by the very forces that are empowered with keeping order in our society. That doesn't feel like one individual threatening me, 
that feels like the whole structure of the society is coming down on my head. And so that's why the association, the American Association of Public Health has identified over-policing as an impediment to, to public health because it leaves people feeling threatened all the time. It's fascinating. You know, it's very interesting to another piece that really, I think, connects all of the, 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 the perspectives the three of you are bringing is this notion of what makes us feel safe and what makes us feel afraid and how contextualized that is. So, um, you know, Aik, so when you were talking about the um, over-policing in schools, a lot of that happened, if I'm understanding this correctly, after Columbine. There was this sense that we must put police officers in school to keep students safe. And that um, adding, replacing um, sort of paraprofessionals and others who were sort of there in the schools with, with uh, licensed police officers would be a way to keep students safe. And as Kendra, you're talking about one person's sense of safety is another person's bear or terror, sense of terror. And so that understanding of when and how do we as individuals feel safe and that recognition that something that might make me feel safe, a close-knit community full of lots of families that I know that's being redlined by somebody who sees it as a risky investment, right? Where somebody else feels like that's home, that feels safe there. And, and Marshall, maybe you could tell us, when we talk about the economy and particularly the dependence of the market on people's perceptions, what is it that is making investors feel safe right now? And what is it that is making investors feel afraid? Well, I think that, that you know, why we see sort of excitement in the market right now is the perception that this thing is at an end. Mm -hmm. um, and whether that is realistic or not, I, I don't know, but the data does seem to put us in a much better place than we were in March. The underlying fundamentals of the economy were pretty strong going into COVID. And, um, you know, the, the sort of, I think it's this combination of perception about the economy and the sort of relief that the government has provided that has allowed businesses and to survive and has, um, you know, I, I think that all that has, 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 has come together in, in, um, in you know stimulating uh, you know stimulating uh, 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 the markets and uh, you know the perception about that 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 we're past this that the economy is going to open up that that sort of the the height of despair in March where hospitals were overcrowded in three cities and it was perceived that that was going to spread across the nation that that hasn't come to fruition so I, I think that's you know I think that's where kind of we are right now is that that the market perceives this is over and perceives this recession as is short-lived that um uh, that that we're you know that we're going to look back at this as a very trying unusual period but it's behind us and and i, I think we all hope this is true um I, I just don't know that i would be as I, you know personally i just wouldn't be as optimistic and so but that's what, you know, that's what I think they're seeing. And, you know, look, I mean, the market's going to react off the fact that there are, you know, a number of different promising vaccine trials, um, uh, you know, a number of different positive things that are going on. There's, there's more money spent on, on, on uh, you know, COVID vaccine and, uh, than, than it's been spent on, you know, all of the diseases in the history of the world. So I just think that, that you know, the fact that a lot of that is going on and people perceive it that once we get that, it's all going to be done and we can go back to our lives, people will start spending again and they'll, all this pent up spending will occur, I think is, is the, the factor um, of what is driving it. Now, remember that, that we base what we think on our perceptions, right? The, the market moves off of a perception of the future, right? So we may perceive things are going to be bad, but if they're less bad than we think, then the market goes up, right? So, I, so I, it's, it's where it's not reality, it's our perceptions of what the future will bring, right? So I think that's the key. It's all, everything that we, we believe is already baked in. So we're moving off those perceptions. It does. Aixa, many of our viewers are asking uh, questions of you specifically about sort of the reopening of schools and what will happen. And are there some of the models that are being talked about, block scheduling or frequent testing or uh, physical testing, I mean, uh, for, for the virus, 
are there some that you see um, as being uh, helpful, particularly for students in, in lower income areas and some uh, of the sort of suggestions that you would see as that's going to just make things worse. Um, you know, you talked a little bit about sort of the smaller class size, that's going to be good for everybody. Are there other things like that, that you would say, oh, that's a public policy that we just no, don't go there. And others that you would say that's promising. Yeah. I mean, I think that whatever model gets proposed and moves forward, um, we should really think about how it might be exacerbating disparities that are already present, right? Um, so I wonder, right, even just there have been models that have been saying that, you know, students can loop back into the same classroom with the same teachers. I think I like that one because there's already sort of um, a relationship that has been built there. Um, you know, there's still some uncertainty about whether they'll redo the same grade or if the teacher will just loop up into the next grade with them. Um, but I do wonder, like, I feel like no matter what model we do choose, um, there is still going to be a gap that is um, sort of exacerbated. Because mm -hmm. you can imagine that those who have the most access to resources and who have the most opportunities, those students are still learning, right? So whether it's tutoring or, you know, access to educational videos, there's those those students who have the most means and the most access they're still progressing whereas we we we've heard and we've seen the facts from this this panel that the students who you know are in families who are still working or who are living in poverty um majority of them being black families um there's a lot to consider there um you know maybe they're taking care of siblings because their parents are at work or maybe they're experiencing um, someone who's ill within the household or somebody who's passed away from the virus. So these are all things to consider. And I'm not sure right now if one is better than the other, but I hope that school leaders are thinking about these things when they're making their decisions. It sounds as though mental health and the disparity in access to that kind of care, even, you know, not just talking about sort of therapeutic interventions, but, but even just basic grief counseling and um, support, uh, anything that, as Kendra was saying, gives you a sense of some control and some process would be helpful um, and, and needs to be thought about as well, particularly when you look at those, at those numbers. Do you have questions for each other? Um, we still have some questions from the audience members, but I wanted to give you a little bit of a chance to see if you have thoughts or ideas of, um, for each other. And as I say to my students, if you don't have questions, I will ask them of you, but, <laughs> but feel free if there are things you're wondering or wanted to ask each other. Exactly. I do have a question, Kendra, and I thought you had one because you unmuted yourself, and that's like the new sort of like raising your hand, you take yourself off mute. <laughs> but um, I know you're affiliated with some hospital systems here in, in Memphis, and uh, what are those conversations around sort of these racial disparities in healthcare? What are those looking like? Are, are the decision makers within the hospital systems taking those into consideration? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I'd say that there are two different kinds of conversations going on in hospital systems about health disparities. The first is that we have um, clinical determinants of health disparities, and those are primarily happening when we've got unconscious bias on the part of healthcare providers, and then they're also happening when we have um, structures in place like the computer algorithms that assign um, triaging scores that, that perpetuate bias apart from any individual. And so trying to trying to root out those clinical determinants, in some ways, that's the lower threshold. Um, and then the second kind of um, conversation that's going on is that um, healthcare providers, you know, like most Americans, operate with this agency bias, which is to say the tendency to explain things in terms of individual choices. So we see an African-American patient who is obese and diabetic and who continues eating fast food on a regular basis. And we wanna say, uh, you know, like, why aren't you following the plan of care? 
um, what, but that doesn't work, right? What, what you need to acquire um, what Dorothy Roberts calls structural competence. You need to learn to ask what's the bigger story here? What are the root causes? And so teaching uh, healthcare providers to recognize that a lot of what's coming to them is not actually a medical problem, it's a social problem. And to, to learn to think of those root causes doesn't help you give better sort of medical care in, in a technical sense, but what it does is help you form a therapeutic alliance with a patient by removing that sense of judgment and blame. And that's just absolutely crucial to building trust with communities that have historically been really abused by the medical industry. So kind of rooting out that agency bias, those are the kinds of conversations we're having. And you're right, I unmuted myself to this question, right? And it was actually a question for you, but I think it relates to what Marshall was talking about as well. And it has to do with, um, oh wow, I just, sorry, I lost my place. Um, okay, so in healthcare context, we're talking about we're looking at these things as medical problems, but they're not, they're actually social problems. And I was curious how that question gets framed in educational context. When you're seeing something that we're asking schools to solve, um, but it's not actually an educational problem. And like, where do you start with that? And that, that has some, some economic impact too. Um, and I'm curious about places where we're sort of expecting the economy to fix things that that aren't at root economic problems. But I, I was just curious about, I'm sure that same thing happens in schools. Yeah, definitely. So even with, you know, Marjorie's sort of introduction to when I was starting to speak, um, education system is a sort of mirror of all of the other systems in our society. So those are definitely there. I think that most recently I've started to see some cities um, sort of opt into this alternate funding plan. So traditionally schools are funded by um, uh, property tax. Um, so that, you know, neighborhoods who pay higher property taxes have schools that are better funded. Um, and there are a couple of cities that I've seen, I think Shelby County has been trying it for the last couple of years, where the, the formula for how schools are getting funded is actually based off of equity. So let's see where the need is and let's provide more funds to those schools. So I think that there is some, you know, um, some movement to get away from these sort of practices that we are now seeing are super inequitable, um, you know, and housing and schools are so tightly paired. Um, you know, people move into neighborhoods because there are good schools there. Well, there are good schools there because they are higher funded and have more resources because of the property tax. So it's this circle that was like, well, how do we break that? Well, I think that there is some movement at policy levels to create funding structures that aren't based on property tax and are actually based on need. Um, so that's something that I've, I've seen that's new, but it's only one thing. Mm -hmm. I, so one of our um, viewers asked a question, and maybe this is putting on your, your uh, psychologist hat. Um, what what is going to be the impact on children? And this really, I mean, I'm asking for all of us. I think not just on children, but um, children coming back into school in a context where everyone's wearing a mask is that is that something we have to think about? How does that change how we relate to each other? What is that going to feel like to us, and particularly to children in schools? Yeah, I mean, I think about that a lot. I think about that for my own classes, right? So even at the college level, I'm like, well, can I do small group work when, you know, people can't get into small groups, right? If we're social distancing, I can't say, you know, uh, roll over to your partner and, you know, talk about this. So I think it's a problem that I'm even thinking about. I think it has larger implications for younger students. Um, so I've heard some models of like, you know, half of the kindergarten will, kindergarten class will come in and they just have to sit in their desks and we're going to keep those desks six feet apart. Right. And I, I mean, I don't think, I don't remember, I mean, when I remember kindergarten, I remember it's like playtime on the carpet with, with others, right? So I think it's more just, it's more than just the half, the, the need to wear masks, but it's also how are we socializing with each other, right? Schools aren't just academic institutions. You also learn a lot of soft skills. 
you know, how to be with others. And I don't know what that's going to look like when there are all of these sort of restrictions and guidelines on how we can be with others. It's, you know, as I speak with, um, you know, friends making decisions about sending their children back to school, just that level of anxiety, it's very high. And Kendra, as you were pointing out, when our anxiety is high, that's a health risk for all of us at a moment when we really all need to um, keep our immune system strong. So it's, it's very profound. Um, this has been a fascinating panel. You have all just brought so much to this. I'm grateful to our viewers and to um, everyone who has tuned in. I, I have just one or two more questions from our audience that I'd love to let us sort of finish up about. So you start to think, uh, panelists, if you have any kind of final comments you want to make. But while you're thinking about that, um, I will um, ask you, uh, Marshall, this is really for you. How confident, uh, somebody asks, how confident can we be in the data and statistics, particularly the economic data that's coming um, from government sources? Um, I think they may be thinking particularly, there was some questions about that jobs report you re uh, referred to and was there some inaccuracies in either the way it was reported or the way it was done. Do you feel like we, you have confidence and where are the sources you go to uh, that you have confidence in to get good economic data? So I think there are measurement issues coming from the BLS, Bureau of Labor Statistics associated with the unemployment numbers. They attest to the fact that, that um, you know, there's this measurement problem with the people who are employed but not working, right, as part of the PPP. So, so, you know, a lot of people say that unemployment is actually 3% higher than what is being measured, but I think the important part about it is it's 3%, it's 3 higher both in April and in May, so the change is still big. You know, I, I think the, the broader question of is can we believe these government statistics? I mean, the people who are at the BLS or the BEA, they tend to be sort of entrenched economists. They're not political appointees. And so, you know, the, the, you know, the same people who'd be saying that, that Trump is cooking the books on the far left or the people who on the far right were saying Obama was cooking the books in, you know, when he was president. So I, I, I think that, you know, we haven't seen sort of criticism of the numbers from any of the either left or right media um, and even, you know, economists who I trust who are very left leaning um, you know, have explained, you know, believe the numbers. And so, but look, I mean, ultimately, as in this whole thing, we've seen that the data is, is suspect. And um, uh, this will be wonderful for social scientists to look at three, five, 10 years from now, because we just, we really don't know where we stand. And I think, um, I think that's, you know, it's, it's hard talking about this in part, because we just don't know a lot about what's going in, on. And I think that made things certainly much worse uh, in, in March, right, in terms of expectations. Thank you, thank you. Uh, as I said, this has just been fascinating. I'd like to give each of you an opportunity if you just have sort of a, a final word, maybe you can focus it on, um, um, you know, the, 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 the pieces you're gonna be looking at in this next moment. A particular, you know, if you have a sense of hope or a sense of what can we look to, what do we wanna take out of this time and move um, and move forward with and and Kendra, I'll, I'll start with you if you have some final thoughts for us. Yeah, I think for me, this is not primarily about COVID. For me, it's about how COVID, as a lens, helps us see deeper disparities. And so, this is a moment when I think a lot of white people are starting to really wake up and see the the see the um the structures that were invisible to us before and so this is a great time for us to start educating ourselves and that might mean following on twitter somebody that makes you feel a little uncomfortable it might mean um starting a book club and and getting yourself educated about um you know what is white fragility what do people mean by that and we're hearing defund the police what could that possibly mean and instead of dismissing it as something that sounds impossible and crazy say okay 
This is an idea that's been around for a while. It's pretty well researched. It's not to say everybody has to agree with it, but this is a good time to, to sort of educate myself about those things. And then this is a little cheesy, but uh, you know, COVID does help us see how much being out of control is bad for us. Mm -hmm. And so it's also a good time to remember we need to take care of ourselves. You know, sleep as much as you need to and drink your water and, and check in on people around you and, um, and uh, especially if you're white, um, do a lot of listening. This is just a really good time to listen and learn. Thank you very much. Marshall, your thoughts? Well, I think, you know, in terms of what I'm going to follow, I'm just going to, you know, try to uh, really watch the, the market and see what direction it's leaning. Um, I think, um, you know, we'll see is these states sort of make this, make decisions to reopen and the consequences that has. I think that'll be borne out in terms of the reaction of the market. You know, I think it's important for us to think about, um, you know, segments of the economy that this is really affected. I think especially of our grad of, our, of this cohort who are in their 30s right now who came out um, in the in the midst of the first recession. And so we're underplacing the economy and we're probably just getting the foothold now. Um, maybe we're starting their own businesses. Maybe we're moving up where they worked and then saw everything wiped away. Um, you know, I, I think a lot about that. And again, we'll see more as we look at those numbers down the road. But, um, you know, I'm hopeful that, that this is a quick recovery and that this will, um, that this will be something that will look back at um, years from now is this unusual period with a fast recovery, but uh, really, it really, it's, it's, it's who knows. Yeah. And the recovery may, may, may be different because of these other social forces may ask and demand that that recovery be spread out more fully. Um, and so it may be a different kind of recovery as well. No doubt. Yeah. So I'd like to echo a lot of what Kendra said. I think that just having everything that's going on in the world happen at the same time is really sort of bringing things to the forefront. So I think unlearn a lot of what you've been taught because mm -hmm. a lot of what people have been taught in this country is misleading and leading us into these really wild, uh, making these real wild attributions about why these problems are happening um, in the first place. Um, something I tell my students a lot and I'm trying to do too is always question when you see these numbers the way they are ask yourself why mm -hmm. um why is it that Shelby County Schools has you know a population of black students upwards of 70 but the city Kendra said is in the 50s right so think about how the demerger um affected you know students in Memphis um you know white families when you're making decisions decisions about your children's education Think about, is it affecting others negatively, right? So instead of thinking just about, you know, ourselves, I think that there has to be some collective understanding of how our decisions are affecting others. Um, you know, if you're choosing to, you know, take away resources from one, um, really understand what that means for that lived experience of that person and that family. Mm -hmm. it, is, it is remarkable, I think, how this you know, a public health emergency, if it reminds us of anything, it is our shared dependence on each other, right? That my behavior affects you and vice versa. We are, we are a community and we are, we are embodied beings. We are very vulnerable and our, our, our well-being depends um, on the collective as much as it depends maybe more even than on our own individual decision making etc so those are that's a powerful lesson and we've seen it played out so visibly and it's a source of fear but it also may be a source of hope i i find there's lots to feel hopeful about at this moment thank you so much to all of you who have tuned in and for your wonderful questions um next week we will have the fourth um and final uh uh, presentation in this series and it is going to focus on sort of well-being and how do we cope with these changes and how can we care for ourselves and care for our families and care for our communities in a time of great disruption so we look forward to seeing all of you there I'd like to thank uh, Matt Jarian and our communication uh, chief communication officer and uh, Dr. Jeff Bakewell who is the the sort of brains behind this uh, 
and organizer and producer of this series. This has been a wonderful, fruitful conversation. Thank you all very much. Um, I always have a moment of sort of how do we say goodbye on Zoom because you're in this active space and then you click off and it's quiet and you're alone. So, right. So we'll just take a little bit of this good feeling of spirit and community and um, Rhodes Brilliance with us. And I wish you all a wonderful evening. Thank you again very, very much.